when he went home back, he transcribed the third talk. <clears throat> the great man, the importance of a mental awareness. And <clears throat> he put on computers. And then now, his Dhammadana, <coughs> Dhamma gift now to you, the talk, the importance of a mental <coughs> awareness. <coughs> I told him it's better for him or for us to transcribe all the talks here and then we're going to make and do a book. <clears throat> I told him he said he tried. <clears throat> yes, now we have finished our talk. three months, uh, three weeks meditation retreats. <clears throat> if it is a retreat, is it three months, is it better? <laughs> but um, but uh, you can't stay for three months. Mm -hmm. You have to work. <clears throat> That's why I do not teach. I do not teach the three months, just the three weeks. <clears throat> then when you, when you go home back, you have to practice meditation regularly on an everyday basis. <clears throat> so, if you are not able to continue the practice at home, then your mindfulness and concentration will be not very much beneficial <clears throat> to you. And also later, also when you uh, want to join any retreat in days or two weeks or three weeks. <clears throat> if you practice at home, you can maintain some degree of mindfulness and concentration, which will be conducive to your concentration and mindfulness in the next retreat. And also, you may have uh, some progress uh, <clears throat> in your meditation at all if you have the said about hmm, uh, two or three sittings together with uh, the walking meditation. <clears throat> so at home, you should keep a period of time such as one hour or two hours, at least 30 minutes <clears throat> for meditation. Better to have one session in the morning, in early morning, and the other in the evening, if it's possible. If it's not possible, you should, say, meditate early morning, at least one session. When you have one hour's time for meditation, first of all, you should practice walking meditation, about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, the remaining period for sitting meditation. Every sitting meditation should be preceded by walking meditation, because in the walking meditation, the lifting, pushing, dropping movement of the foot is very distinct to concentrate on. <clears throat> so walking is better than sitting. But when you are meditating experience, is an advanced stage in a retreat or in a meditation center. But sitting is better than walking. In the beginning or at home, I think walking meditation will be better than sitting because 
in the walking, the object of meditation is more distant to your mind than in sitting. So you should walk, say, about 10 or 15 minutes and then carry over the, the mindfulness and concentration you have attained walking meditation until you have settled down yourself on the seat for meditation. Then the concentration and mindfulness you attain in walking meditation will be conducive to the concentration and mindfulness and your sitting meditation. Say, if you have a half an hour's time for meditation, then please walk for 10 minutes and another 20 minutes for sitting. But if you have, say, two hours or three hours on such a day as Saturday, Sunday and public holiday, then you can walk, say, one hour and sit one hour or one and a half hour or two. <clears throat> in the same way you should do in the evening, if you have time enough for meditation. But what you should be careful is <clears throat> not to feel to note, to observe any thought arising in the sitting as well as in the walking. Only when you are able to know thoughts, thoughts become less and less, then you can concentrate your mind to a certain extent on the object. Unless the thoughts are noted, then they, be, they doesn't become less. They become so worse and worse, and um, sometimes it, they are floating in the mind or direct your mind a very long time. <clears throat> so not to fail to note any thought, thinking, wondering, imagination, planning, seeing mental pictures, or any emotional states such as sadness, anger, hatred, and so on. In the Westerners' mind, anger is abundant. Yes, the Westerners' mind is full of anger. <clears throat> Their mind is very sensible to have anger, but not Eastern and not so. <clears throat> Even in meditation, they have a lot of anger when they are not satisfied with their practice and with uh, any disturbance. It's uh, very difficult. <laughs> so whatever anger or sadness arises must be noted until it has disappeared. Note it very attentively, energetically. And it will be, it will go away. <clears throat> but in, at home, most of the time you have to deal with these thoughts because the home is the not the has a not atmosphere of meditation. It's atmosphere of uh, restlessness. Because you have to do many works, uh, you have to have uh, the social dealings a great deal. Then as to daily activity, meditation is not to be practiced at the meditation center or at the meditation retreat. The Buddha teaches us to apply this meditation to our daily life. So at home too, you can apply this awareness of daily activities. <clears throat> You need not slow down at home, any actions or movements. You should do them normally, but you should be aware of what you are doing without labeling, without noting. Just be aware of it generally, not specifically. Only when you are able to slow down, you can specifically 
not observe any actions or movements. But if you do anything the normally or quickly, you are not able to specifically aware of. Uh, <clears throat> so you have to apply general awareness of what you are doing and you are daily routine at home, doing all the things normally and steadily. In this way, you can accumulate your mindfulness and your concentration gradually, and you can maintain your mindfulness and meditation to a certain extent. <clears throat> That's what I want to uh, tell you as a concluding talk. So, now enough. Then questions and answer. The first question is how can we maintain progress in our practice without access to a teacher for guidance after we leave here? And how should our practice at home be structured? Yes. Now I have explained you. <laughs> I have explained you. <coughs> yes, uh, without access to a teacher, but you have practiced now three weeks here, so you know the technique and you know to correct your meditative practice to a certain extent. Yes, if there's a teacher, <clears throat> then you can make more progress. But unless you have teachers, the your correct practice is your teachers. The correct pra practice is to observe any object precisely, attentively, at the moment of its occurrence, <clears throat> say, at present. And another one is, just now I explained you, to note, to observe, to watch whatever mental state arises <clears throat> in sitting as well as in the walking. But in doing daily activity at home too, there may be some strong emotional states such as sadness, worry, anger, and so on. These strong emotional states must be observed, must be watched, must be noted until they have disappeared. Actually, in the daily activity, you should not pay any attention to thoughts ordinary thoughts, thinking, wondering, imagining. But uh, these strong emotional states must be dealt with so that they can, uh, they have disappeared. If you do not <coughs> note mental states such as thought, thinking, wondering, imagining, planning, uh, seeing mental fixtures, then this thought will become bigger and bigger, larger and larger. Then it may create some undesirable, undesirable things in your mind. Then you may be, you may go astray. So, to avoid that, you should should not fail to note any thought, thinking, wondering, imagining, planning, seeing mental image images and so on. Then another question, Sierra, if all of us, all of the people in the world overcame, overcome the desire for existence, the human race would slowly disappear from the earth as no more children would be born. 
So what then? How can one look at it in inspiring way? Yes, if <clears throat> the desire for existence for human beings <clears throat> has uh, totally disappeared, or has been uprooted by the realization of a mental and physical phenomena, not only human race, but also all living beings will disappear from the earth. Very good. Don't worry. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> you see, the world is full of a sensual pleasure and sensual desire. <laughs> Never all the people cannot um, disappear from the earth, but because they have, uh, uh, they are full of uh, a great deal of a desire for existence. <laughs> Don't worry about it. This question is a Lanka. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, Uh, another question. In reading, conditioning is mentioned often. Could, could we please have a few words uh, on condition? Thank you. Yes. Condition. is uh, the cause. The most of the time, in the book on Vipassana meditation, condition, the word condition is mentioned as cause. So, <clears throat> when you say, the, when you note Intending, lifting, pushing, dropping, touching, pressing. Intending, lifting, pushing, dropping, touching, pressing. The, it's an intention that causes the action, say the movement of lifting, pushing, dropping. So the intention is a condition. Lifting movement, say it's an effect. The intention is the condition. Pushing movement is the, is the effect. Then intention is the condition. And uh, dropping movement is the, it's the, it's the effect. So condition when it's used and uh, most of the book on Buddhism uh, on the Vipassana meditation, <coughs> it's used as the sin in the sense of a cause. Then another question: How can chemical force arise from actions which originate in mental constructions and volitions, which are essentially empty? and uh, impersonal. It seems there's uh, no doer of deeds, either wholesome or unwholesome. Yes. <clears throat> if you have the idea a person or a doer which do, does any action, that idea is wrong idea. It's called the wrong view of a personality, individuality. Because actually there's no doer. Only there's action. Say, <clears throat> when you Walk, you note lifting, uh, intending, lifting, pushing, dropping, touching, pressing. There, when the concentration is deep enough, 
you are not aware of uh, the, the shape of the food. What you are the realizing is the just a lifting movement, the movements, and pushing movement, dropping movements. These movements are actions. They arise depending on their cause, that's the intention. Without any intention, there won't arise any actions or movement. There won't arise any lifting movement, pushing movement. <clears throat> when there's an intention, there's a lip, lifting movement. When there's an intention, there's a pushing movement. When there's an intention, you need not prevent the food not to lift from lifting. It, it's lifted because of the intention. So you are not the person who lifted the food. It's the intention that causes the lifting of the food. So there's no doer. <coughs> Whatever action it may be, there's no doer. Then <coughs> the karmic folks, karmic folks, as you said, arise from actions which originate in mental constructions and volitions. Yes, especially this karmic force comes from volition and mental states. But when the volition has disappeared, that force is remained in the process of a the following consciousness. So <clears throat> there's a no one who can create this force. It's the only volition which the creates or which uh, brings about, which brings about this force, coming force. So whether there's a no doer or not, when there's a volition, there will be coming force in the process of our consciousness. So this force, as you know, is it's a neither a mentality nor a physicality. So it says a no arising and passing away. Only mentality has the nature of arising and passing away. The mentality arises and then passes away. The mentality, uh, physicality also rises and passes away. But this force is not neither a mentality or no physicality. It's a, the, the light. So when a person who say who is a crazy with his uh, weapon, say to, with the gun, came into the hall. He didn't, he doesn't do anything, but he can, comes into the, the hall. As soon as uh, he is uh, in the hall, we feel fears. You feel fears. Why? Does he do anything to you? Or does he do any harm to you? No. Yes, he is in the hall. But the force of his, the madness or craziness affects us. So we fear that is the force. In this, in this way, every Anger has its force. Every the mentality has its force. You feel when you are angry, then say you oppress, you suppress this anger by any means. Then the anger has disappeared. Even though the anger has disappeared, it's a force in you. You feel it. In the same way, when the volition arises, 
after it is a disappearance, it's a force in the process of a consciousness. That kind of force <clears throat> produce when the time is ripe, uh, the pro produce its result in this existence or another existence. But it has uh, neither appear, neither arising or no disappearing, no passing away, because it's a neither a mentality nor f physicality. <clears throat> Then here, another question. I have come to believe that it's desirable for Westerners to refuse to visit Burma. <clears throat> yes, and no one requested Westerners to visit Burma. <clears throat> to refuse to visit Burma as a protest of a slow's actions to allow Do Aung San Suu Kyi's, Do Aung San Suu Kyi's legitimate right to form a government and also to condemn their gross human rights <clears throat> abuses against the Burmese people. Please comment. Yes. I'm not a politician, so I cannot comment on it. <laughs> there, another question. In the past, I have had a very difficulty, difficult to maintain mindfulness and meditation or daily life once I leave the serenity of a retreat. The Western lifestyle is demanding on one's time and energy. Please comment. Yes. Do free from this Western life, you should come to Chamiyeda to Burma to practice meditation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you have to struggle with your time for meditation. You should try at least to spend on meditation, to spend, yes, on meditation about at least 15 or 20 minutes a day. Then if you are able to maintain 15 or 20 minutes of meditation daily, later on you'll be able to increase the duration of uh, that meditation. And the point is that you should take keenly interest at uh, meditation. That's the point. Then another question. Sierra, do the insight once attained by the meditator, have a permanent effect on the consciousness of the person? Or can they be somehow forgotten? Yes. <clears throat> Insight say, Monday insights, like a super Monday insight, like a, such as enlightenment, has <clears throat> a permanent effect on the person, on the meditator, if he has experienced <clears throat> some insight in his meditation. Unless this uh, Inside mundane or supra mundane has its effect, is a permanent effect on a meditator. There won't be any sotapanna. There won't be any, the first person of enlightenment, the second, the third, and the arahan. And uh, you see, an arahan, when he has completely uprooted all 
mental defilement through his final <coughs> experience of enlightenment. Then his mind is all the time eternally purified from this defilement. This enlightenment then may can affect on the Arahan as a purif purification of a mind. <coughs> In the same way, when a meditator has experienced the insight knowledge of it, especially the higher stages by inside knowledge, such as the fifth jnana, inside knowledge of a dissolution, uh, sixth jnana, inside knowledge of uh, awareness of uh, fearfulness, and so on. The, this insight, experience of uh, insight, have a permanent effect on meditator because he experiences rising in person away instantly and constantly rising in person away of a phenomena. <clears throat> so he never take the any phenomena as a permanent when he recollect his experience. But when he does not recollect his experience, it may not affect him on his, uh, on his persons. But when he recollect his experience in meditation, even though he is at home or he is doing his work, that experience comes to his mind as if he is now experiencing it. So it affects our meditators. Then another question. Venerosa, please share some information about your monasteries in Myanmar and South Africa. I think they would find it interesting. Yes. <coughs> I think now you have you have got a pamphlet flat <coughs> in which uh, the about the information of our, our monastery in Myanmar uh, is mentioned. We have <coughs> in Rango a meditation center. <coughs> which he established in 1977. <clears throat> then in that meditation center, we accept anyone who takes interest in meditation and to, pre to practice meditation, either Myanmar or either foreigners. <clears throat> the especially we never charge the foreigners free food, free accommodation, free medicine. Some of the medicines are free if it's available in Burma. Burma is a very poor country. Sometimes some of the medicines, medicines are not available. <clears throat> but we have also another meditation center in the forest, in semi-forest, about 30 miles from Ringo. That forest meditation center is a found, was a founded in 1995. <clears throat> from the time onward, most of the Thai foreigners are practicing there. <clears throat> All the year round, and last, August. In the last August, there are about 35 foreign meditators practicing there. And in the Rangoon Center, 
there are about 50 meditators practicing there. The forest meditation center is uh, quieter than the Rango. Rango center is uh, close to uh, a road like this. This one is uh, close to that road. So when the cars goes there, <coughs> A meditator has, is, is disturbed to sudden extent when their concentrations are not mature. The okay, concentrations are not good enough. When the concentrations are good enough, <coughs> he is not disturbed by such a noise as a car. <coughs> but uh, and, uh, the forest meditation center is uh, called a mobi. Its the name is Mobi Chamiyeda. It's also mentioned in the, the leaflet. <clears throat> You'll find it. It in the leaflet. It mentions uh, the land is about ten acres now. Not ten acres. It's an increase. Now thirteen acres land. <clears throat> uh, the Unusual feature in the center is that I put up the meditation platforms under the very big shade trees, about the four by four feet wooden platforms with the roof, zinc roof, and so on. Now the <coughs> some over here. Vincent and Nancy, they practiced there for sometimes about, I think, one and a half month. Two months. Two months. Two months. <clears throat> I built up about 60 meditation platforms under the big shade trees there. And also here, you see, you have uh, mosquitoes here. We have also the same, <laughs> but <clears throat> I provide mosquito nets <clears throat> on each platform, so it's a very good. <clears throat> uh, you'll see it there. I invite all of you to come there and practice long-term meditation at least three months. <laughs> Two or three months. <clears throat> Vida Ravlansky is planning to come there for about three or four years as a monk when he has retired. <laughs> <clears throat> he also practiced in Rangon Center one week as a monk. Not one week, one month, one was three months, no? Mm. <clears throat> in the South Africa, the devotees in South Africa invited me to come there and the, to deliver Dhamma talks, to kind of meditation retreat, so I went in 1995. There, most suburb devotees, Burmese devotees, are doctors, medical doctors, about 100, <clears throat> together with their families. I told them if they want to <clears throat> contact with Buddhist monks all the time and help their ch children taught by the monks, <clears throat> They should have a monastery there. So they try collect the fund to buy a monastery. And then last year in June, they bought a house in a acres in acres of land. Then I went there and uh, we did inauguration ceremony on, in June, yes, in June last year. And I consecrated a Sima hall, a meditation hall there. And also I ordained 
some of <coughs> doctors, about six doctors, uh, as higher ordination, and they practiced meditation. So there also, <coughs> most of uh, Westerners, especially, say, the Boers, white men, uh, who are descendant of a Dutch people, take interest in meditation. They have their meditation retreat center too, and also there are some who has no center but take interest in meditations. <clears throat> they later on they can come to my meditation center there and practice meditation. Now in the center, a small meditation, meditation hall about this <coughs> is being built. I think now it's a completed. So I'll have to go to the South Africa in January 1999 and spend there one month um, teaching meditation, conducting meditation retreat, delivering Dhamma talk, not only in South Africa, but also in Botswana, another country too. They are very much interesting. You should go there. Quiet, very quiet. <clears throat> then another question. Sierra, desire and attachment are the cause of a suffering, yet it's the desire for freedom from suffering that makes us practice meditation. If we remove this desire, then what would drive the intention for us to practice? Do we also have to remove the desire for freedom from suffering to obtain it? Very good. Yes. You should remove the desire for freedom from suffering so that you will be <coughs> happy in the suffering of the wrong, the cycle of sansara, rebirths. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Yes. In English, the desire is a, only one sense. So, in the Pali language and in, in the scriptures, we have had two words. One is a tanna, the other is a chanda. Tanna is the desire for unwholesome things. Chanda is a desire for wholesome things. So we never translate chanda into desire. We translate chanda into will, wish, or willingness. But if we want to, to use the word desire for hold something, we have to <coughs> say there are wholesome desire and unwholesome desires. Chanda is a wholesome desire. Tanna is an unwholesome desire. But the wish or will or willingness is the most proper translation of the word chanda. So when we say desire for freedom from suffering, we should say the will for freedom from suffering. So the will for freedom 
from suffering, the world should not be removed. The world must be increased gradually. And the 37 factors of the enlightenment, it's called a body pakia. We have four foundations of mindfulness, four kinds of energy, and the four kinds of the the base of accomplishment. Four foundations for mindfulness are called the Sutipatthana. The four kinds of energy is called the Samabhadana. And the four basis of the accomplishment is called Edipada. Out of four Edipadas, Chanda is there. Chanda is a will, a wish. Then Virya Edipat, energy. Chitta Edipat, consciousness of mind. Vimasa Edipat, insight or wisdom. These, when you have these four bases of the accomplishment, then you are sure to accomplish, to accomplish your work. So there, without will or wish, you do not practice meditation. Because you are willing to get free from suffering. You are willing to practice meditation. That will is a chanda, not tanna, not desire. So if desire is divided into wholesome and unwholesome, tanna is unwholesome desire, chanda is wholesome desire. Unwholesome desire must be totally removed, completely removed. Wholesome desire must be abundantly developed, improved, not to be the uh, removed. So here what you should do is to know the difference between tanha and chanda. Desire for a whole something is a tanna. Will or wish for a whole something is a chanda. Yes, is enough. Hmm. Then another question, Venerable Sierra, will you speak about compassion? How it arises, how it helps in the path to wisdom, how to balance the aspects of the compassion and wisdom. Yes. <coughs> in the four sublime states, of a meditation, there are Mita, Kruna, Mudita, and Upaka. Mita is loving kindness, wishing all living beings peace, happiness. Kruna is a compassion. Mudita is sympathy to joy. Upaka is a equanimity. So. <clears throat> the, uh, the object of accomplishing is the living beings in trouble. A living being who is uh, suffering is the object of accomplishing. When a person <clears throat> sees another living being who is uh, suffering, either mentally or physically, he feels compassion for that, for
for that living beings. Then in this way, compassion arises dependent on a living beings and trouble or suffering. Then, according to the history of Buddhism, the Buddha, when he aspire for being enlightened or being a Buddha, at the time he was a hermit. Though he was a, a hermit, his ability or his experience of a meditation was ripe enough to be arahan, to attain the fourth stage of enlightenment under the instruction of another Buddha who was called Dipankara. The Hamid knew himself. He could attain Arhadamaga, the final stage of enlightenment, under the instruction of this ancient Buddha, Dipankara. But he didn't take, he didn't want to take that enlightenment because he, feel, he felt a great deal of compassion for the living beings who are suffering in the round of rebirths. So he want to save them these beings and leads him to Nibbana, the cessation of suffering, because of that great compassion. So he strives to be enlightened, to be a Buddha. Then, after many, a great number of, innumerable number of existences, then he became a Buddha, Godma Buddha. After he be had become a Buddha, Godma Buddha, he taught the, his disciples how to get rid of this, the round of a suffering, the circle of a suffering, uh, instructing the Noble Eightfold Path, which really lead any living beings to the cessation of suffering. In this way, many living beings, or especially human beings, since the Buddha's the Enlightenment until now, have been practicing <clears throat> This is a noble eightfold part, developing noble eightfold part, and uh, attain the final stretch of enlightenment and acquire uh, the cessation of uh, suffering. In this way, some of uh, human beings uh, has been saved by the Buddha by means of his enlightenment. Then that is based on the great compassion of the Buddha. In the same way, if I have no compassion at all, I won't come here. You follow? I would not have come here if I have no compassion for you. And also, I would not have given any Dhamma talk here. I would not have given any instruction for you to practice meditation, I'll be st I would have stayed in my monastery peacefully. <laughs> if I have no compassion at all, then this compassion is the source of uh, 
wisdom and enlightenment. <coughs> Finish. <coughs>